So these are my conflicts, Gilead, Arrowhead, Springbank, Abbey and Abbott. And um, the organisers have asked me uh, to talk about RNAi and uh, we, we, it's been well known that short interfering double-stranded RNA molecules can lead to uh, uh, transcriptional and translational silencing. Uh, the key enzymes involved have been well characterised through Adrosia and DISA and the um, RNA molecules generated uh, process through the risk apparatus and ARGO and <clears throat> then uh, specifically uh, uh, the target RNA molecules of around 21 to 24 nucleotides um, uh, find their uh, host targets and silence them. So th this technology is not new and um, the pharmaceutical industry have looked at it in the past, the biggest problem has been delivery. And, and we'll discuss that in, in my presentation today, but I'll just give a brief, brief background about RNAi in the context of hepatitis B, um, who are the players and, and what we've got, what we know so far. And uh, obviously we'll hear a lot more about um, things um, happening on that space in AASLD in the next few days. I mean, hepatitis B is the perfect pathogen to sort of use RNAi for because it has this overlapping mRNAs. And, if you, if you designed your, um, take my glasses off because they're not helping. If you, if you designed your um, RNAi trigger targets to this part of the genome here, you can see that you get all four mRNA transcripts at the um, uh, polyadenylation region. Um, this region is also known as the really hot end of the regulatory part of the HPV genome, as well as having the two uh, direct repeats, DR1, DR2. And the importance of this we'll come back to in terms of interpreting some of the E antigen negative data that Arrowhead have generated. The other spot I'll refer to, most other companies have targeted more the envelope protein here using uh, what Arrowhead have called 75. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I'll, the reason for that will become pretty obvious uh, also in, with the E antigen negative cases. So really, uh, hepatitis B, a great target. Let's see how we go in terms of the results. So we're used to hepatitis B life cycle. We've heard from the virologists this morning that uh, the nukes work through the, um, and, and block the reverse transcriptase pathway and block DNA replication. And really that has been the major sort of armamentarium that we've used for hepatitis B the last 20 years. Um, what the whole idea about the RNAi approach is that it actually targets the proteins. By blocking the, um, and hitting the RNA, obviously, the translation of the, all of the, all of the hepatitis B proteins are affected, and uh, not just the viral DNA, but also core E, uh, X and S. And um, therefore, we're going to see a sort of a, uh, a panorama of antiviral effects due to RNAi, whereas we only see with the nukes uh, HPV DNA replication. Now, the groups that are involved in RNAi therapy uh, Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, ARC520, which we'll discuss in a minute in Phase 2. ARC521 is coming um, out of Phase 1, going in, was about to go into Phase 2. <clears throat> um, Arbutus Biopharma, have the, their lead molecule is ARB1467, um, coming out of Phase 1, going into Phase 2. And the third player, um, which is, uh, is l Nylam Pharmaceuticals, uh, and that my understanding is that they're in Phase 1. Okay, so what are the, um, the, the molecules that we've got? The first molecule from um, um, Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals is the, uh, is the ARC520. It consists of two sort, sorts of, uh, by the bedside, if you like, if you, vial one is, is the excipient, which is the, 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 uh, the, the carrier, and um, it's really is a powder. Uh, the other vial that's found by the bedside is um, the actual um, RNAi molecules themselves shown here, the vial 2, which has got cholesterol at, the, at one of the ends for, um, of, the, of each of the siRNAs. And vial 2 is used to dissolve the, uh, the excipient or the carrier DPC, dynamic polyconjugate. And um, it, the whole idea of the ARC520 strategy is that uh, you stir up the endosomal compartments. Uh, the uh, incipient has N-acetylgalactosamine, uh, uh, bound to it, and so that, that gives it its liver targeting specificity. The cholesterol uh, on the ARC520 RNAi triggers also gives it the um, uh, liver t relative liver targeting, and that you're hoping to get these two molecules together in the same endosome. And acidification of the endosome results in some chemical modifications that res re re allows uh, the release of the RNAi triggers into the reducing environment of the cytoplasm. 
Um, and believe it or not, that works well in 80 to 85% of the time. The distribution studies in the pharmacokinetic studies in, in animals have shown that over 80 to 85% of the ARC520 ends up in the liver. So that's just a sort of a brief summary of the dynamic polyconjugate technology that Arrowhead are using. So uh, you can see it, see it here that uh, it's got the n galactosamine um, and, um, and that's really the secret to, uh, to, to their success. Um, in terms of their trigger design, um, what we've got here is their two major lead compounds. So this is sort of a, um, a summary of all of the uh, various trigger targets that they made. Um, and the, um, I'll just check my site. I can't see the numbers from here, but the, um, uh, the, the two lead compounds are the DR1, DR2 region, and the other one uh, for the, uh, as we'll see, the EN to negative region is the, uh, is, is shown here in the, in the S protein. Um, they screened a very large number of sequences out of gene bank and then they made uh, over um, uh, several hundred molecules in, in cell culture, then selected the ones that were most effective and most conserved, and that was the DO1, DR2 region, not surprisingly. Uh, in terms of their sort of preclinical data, they had good cell culture data. It was pan-genotypic, effective against all the major genotypes. And uh, this is actually its effect on core antigen expression in the livers of transgenic mice. And you can see that the ARC520 has significantly uh, resulted in inhibition of uh, core antigen expression. Now, the other uh, player, so what I'll do, I'll do the preclinical data for the three uh, RNAi companies. Uh, the Arbutus uh, compound uh, is 1467, uh, and that, that's sort of background to its, uh, um, um, its, its, its sort of rationale for why Arbutus are moving into the RNAi space. Um, unlike uh, Arrowhead, they've got uh, not, not two, but three uh, lead RNAi triggers, um, basically fo focusing a little bit outside the regulatory elements of DR1, DR2, um, and the, uh, the, re the regions are shown for you here. And a linearized genome, you can sort of give a, a bit more of a spatial orientation about where their triggers are, uh, are targeted to. Um, They've also used a sort of a lipid-style based um, delivery system, the, the lipid nanoparticle or the LNP platform, and they use the, um, uh, the, these three triggers are then piled up into that and then delivered intravenously. Both the ARC520 uh, and the um, ARB 1467 are given intravenously. Uh, like the um, 520, they're also pangenotypic. Here it shows a dramatic effect against the um, the, the, the genotypes of, uh, or the major genotypes of hepatitis B, A, B, C, and D. And um, they've done uh, very good effective studies in their um, humanized mouse model. Uh, they've shown good uh, over a log reduction in S antigen and uh, significant percent reductions, but not virologically significant, but statistically significant levels in terms of CCC DNA, uh, DNA um, uh, HPV DNA, and also in E antigen. So um, th these agents are effective in, as, as antiviral inhibitors, certainly of the, of the viral proteins. The CCC DNA mechanism hasn't really been explored by the Arbutus group yet, but I'm sure it is under study. So Arbutus are currently putting it in combination with um, various um, agents, including the traditional nukes. So this is a study showing that uh, in combination, here's a control um, um, study with uh, um, versus the entecavir, and here is the Arbutus uh, RNAi molecule, and there's no, certainly, antagonism with entecavir uh, in terms of effect on HBV DNA and, uh, and effect on, on hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, they've also done in vitro combinations with their own capsid inhibitor, and this data will be presented at AASLD coming up next week. Their capsid inhibitor is AB423. Um, and you can see here that, uh, they, again, their capsid inhibitor in combination with um, uh, their uh, RNAi inhibitor is at least additive. The l um story is uh, not, not quite as advanced. It also has a multi-component lipid uh, nanoparticle platform for delivery. Um, more like um, uh, uh, Arrowhead, they've got, they've got two RNAi triggers shown for you here in the slide taken from their website. I was unable to contact anybody at the company to find any further information. So at the moment, um, summarising their, their, their current preclinical data, 
Uh, they were able to show that their RNAi triggers were effective in mouse models of uh, HPV. Um, what's the, the big advantage would be straight up that this is, this is given subcutaneously rather than intravenously as in the previous two molecules. And uh, they've got potent and durable knockdown of surface antigen up to 1.6 logs uh, with a single dose. Uh, the multiple doses resulted in durable knockdown without, without a rebound effect. And they were aiming for sort of monthly uh, doses at uh, three milligram per kilogram. Um, that would be what they're moving towards clinically. And that the, the, the company is expecting to see uh, clinical data around mid next year. So we obviously wait with great interest to see how, how this approach <clears throat> will differ or, or from the uh, existing ones I've just highlighted, especially with Arrowhead. So, I'll now spend the remainder of my talk on the Arrowhead clinical data, and I'll include in that the chimpanzee data. The chimpanzee data really um, has been a very, very thought-provoking and sort of almost paradigm-changing in terms of our understanding of the virology of hepatitis B, especially the E antigen negative phase of hepatitis B. So this was their um, treatment protocol. They had uh, nine chimps um, um, from memory of... Uh, I can't read it, I think it's five E antigen and four positive and then four E antigen negative. And they treated them for up to 12 months. And this is the sort of uh, typical protocol that they used in the animals. These, these experiments were done by Robert Lanford at uh, San Antonio. Now straight up, this is the uh, a pool data and, a, and it's a really important way to sort of capture and what we realized was happening in terms of, um, uh, of the differential effect on surface antigen between the E antigen positive and the E antigen negative animals. And you can see straight up that uh, there's a very modest antiviral effect seen with these sort of monthly infusions given to these animals in the E antigen negative group with a very modest reduction of less than one log reduction of surface antigen. Whereas the E antigen positive chimps showed at least 1.5 to over two log reductions um, in, the, uh, in the surface antigen. And, um, as you'll see in a minute, that's actually translated to what we saw in the clinic as well. The off-treatment effects were very good. This was actually uh, showing that uh, the, the off-treatment um, antiviral effects, certainly from an S antigen point of view, were sustained um, past, um, past a significant period of time. And uh, you'll notice, and I think that was quite significant, these flares that were seen off-treatment. And um, Carlo Ferrari did some studies on these and showed that they were uh, immune-mediated through the typical T-cell markers. Now, the clinical data is really interesting, and so uh, when they fir first did the studies in um, Antikovir suppressed um, E antigen negative patients, it was a very modest antiviral effect was observed, but um, in terms of S antigen reduction, which was the primary endpoint of the study. The, um, we went to E antigen positive um, and take of suppressed individuals and went to the higher dose that was approved for uh, uh, ARC520, uh, four milligrams uh, single dose, and you can see we were able to get a little bit more, uh, just a little bit over one log reduction. In the um, E antigen positive and take of naive individuals, uh, we were able to get almost two log reduction in surface antigen. Um, and uh, in the broader sort of cohort of um, the, so this sort of summarizes all of that data. Uh, for the S antigen reduction. Uh, we also got significant reduction in the E antigen uh, per, per level. And over here is that using the four milligram dose uh, in, the co in cohort uh, seven, the, uh, you can see here a very modest half log reduction in the E antigen negative cohort. So that sort of summarizes very nicely here that the um, surface antigen log drop was uh, achieved by um, the, all the E antigen positive patients um, and are very modest with um, the E antigen negative. Uh, for pressures of time, I won't discuss that, but the, uh, just to sort of go back to that sort of observation that was made in the chimps, that the E antigen negative chimps had a modest effect and the E antigen positive animals had the significant two log reduction. Uh, the company was able to, again, in collaboration with Robert Lanford, um, investigated uh, the, the virological mechanism for that. And uh, using the sort of conventional PCR-based approach of actually uh, the mRNA and also the CCC DNA in liver biopsies from these animals, uh, Robert and was able to show and presented um, last year at Easel that most of the HPV DNA uh, in the liver of E antigen positive chimpanzees was actually CCC DNA. And, uh, but in terms of um, using the PCR strategy, there was 500-fold less CCC DNA in E antigen negative animals. 
And uh, this suddenly uh, tweaked a little bit to the sort of why, uh, what was the source of the surface antigen in the E antigen negative animals? What was the transcriptional template driving that? And it, uh, the conclusion made based on the RNA studies was that it, indeed it was probably from integrated sequences in the E antigen negative animals. And therefore that's um, uh, not, not a, f and you'll see what, why that's important. Shown for you here in red at the top are the RNAi triggers that Arrowhead had designed. ARC520 has 74 and 77. And uh, the third one was the backup one was 75. And remember 75 here, this was really targeted to the S um, open reading frame. <clears throat> and the 74 and the 77 are to the DR1, DR2 regions. Now, the pathways, depending on the translocation of the primers involved in reverse transcription, if you get translocation of the, uh, uh, of the plus stranded RNA primer, you get uh, circularization of the genome and completion of the uh, full length reverse transcribed copy. If you get failure to translocate the primer, you end up with double stranded linear DNA. And the double stranded linear DNA, Jesse Summers showed, was actually uh, the pre integration precursor for uh, HPV. In, in the majority of uh, studies that he looked at. And so just by, by un, well, by bad luck really for Arrowhead, um, that, that, that's the region um, that DR1, DR2 get lost uh, in the integration process. So if you looked at the, um, the chimps in the E antigen positive animals as well as the E antigen negative animals, there were certainly signals around um, uh, integration but it was in the E antigen negative animals that these uh, signals were the greatest around the DR1, DR2 region. And this study was confirmed um, just uh, recently using the um, Illumina RNA-seq approach that uh, when you look at an E antigen negative animal, and here is the, the DR1, um, here are the uh, DR1, DR2 regions, and this is the, uh, where the RNAi triggers what focus to an ARC520, and here is the E antigen positive animal, E antigen negative animal, and you can see from the RNA seq data that um, in the RNA negative animals, uh, sorry, in the E antigen negative animals, there is um, very low levels amounts of mRNA from that particular part of the HPV life cycle. So you can see that, uh, and then they went on and uh, did that with the PacBio uh, single molecule uh, real-time PCR amplification, and um, in the E antigen positive animals that you, was, you saw the typical RNA replicative intermediates, pre-genomic, the 3.2, so, sorry, the 3.5, and the pre-S, the, um, pre uh, X, and um, uh, uh, mRNAs. But in the E antigen negative mRNA analysis from the, from the infected chimps, they found a plethora of really weird mRNA molecules. Not only did they find a very low amount of the traditional mRNA molecules seen in the E antigen positive animals as the dominant species, but in the E antigen negative animals they saw significant amounts of splicing, fusion and uh, truncated forms of mRNA. And that was, um, they've interpreted as, as accounting for their uh, um, su suboptimal response in um, uh, ARC520 with the 74 and the 77. They've since gone back into ARC521, which is their new lead compound, and ARC521, if you recall, was that other uh, RNAi trigger to the open reading frame of the surface antigen. And, um, and, and so they put that into the chimps after it had gone through safety studies. And you can see here now, here is ARC520, 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 no, no effect. And subset of animals given are still maintained on ARC520. But when the an two, two animals were randomized to ARC521, they got the significant effect that, you were, that we had seen before with the E antigen positive animals. So in conclusion, um, ARC520 up until last night was well tolerated after multiple doses of four milligrams per kilogram, the highest dose tested. Um, and uh, I'm obliged to say that uh, when I did my emails after my 28 hours trip from Melbourne, the FDA has put a clinical hold on ARC520. And uh, the, the, apparently the clinical hold is on the basis not of human toxicity, but of toxicity in primates. Uh, and it's mainly probably due to the, well, their interpretation, or my interpretation would be that it would probably be due to the carrier. But um, in the chimps, the treatment with ARC520 uh, certainly reduced surface antigen in all of the chimps, uh, but the greatest response was seen in the E antigen positive animals and up to 2.7 logs uh, reduction, uh, a lower response in the E antigen negative animals. And uh, the reasons I've given you, uh, uh, I think, support the model that they integrated with HPV DNA 
is likely a significant source of surface antigen, especially in um, the E antigen negative chimps. But I think that the siRNA targeting strategy, uh, certainly with the 521, was able to show that even though um, 520 was good in E antigen positive disease, 521 will be very effective in E antigen negative. So I think I can sort of distill my, uh, the talk down to these three points, take home message, that I think we have actually achieved a new era in HBV antivirals with the RNAi molecules, that we've seen direct antiviral effects on the key proteins of hepatitis B that we haven't in the past before seen, of surface antigen and E antigen. Um, and I haven't presented the data, but uh, the Hong Kong group have also shown core-related antigen likewise is also significantly reduced in the serum. Uh, I think that we've seen a significant difference in viral pathophysiologies between E antigen positive and E antigen negative. And um, Arrowhead have done very well with Robert Lanford collaboration to show the molecular basis for that. Uh, and I think this will have certainly certain important therapeutic and prognostic significance. And I, fact, and I think that the, the sorts of RNA molecules that were seen in the E antigen negative animals, mainly splice and uh, the fusion transcripts, really bode um, strong caution for our optimistic approaches at curing hepatitis B. Thank you very much.